sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since he has been, and then he has been waiting until his enemies will have made a full stall for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And by the Holy Spirit he also testifies to us, for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember, remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. When there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have been confident to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus and by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without waver, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as it is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see they approaching. This is the word of the Lord. find ourselves in the midst of a season of gratitude and generosity. November triumphantly carries these two notions as its major themes. For most churches, the Sunday right before Thanksgiving represents another season of stewardship coming to an end. And for most of us, this Sunday brings some sort of excitement as we prepare ourselves to travel or as we get ready to host loved ones at our homes. But this only also gives us the opportunity to reflect once more on the things that we are grateful for, especially as we think about Thanksgiving on Thursday. So have you thought about what are you grateful for this morning? What about this last week? Or what about this past year? And has your gratitude for such things been transformed into acts of generosity? As part of our training as Lake Fellow residents, we are required to attend and participate in a weekly seminar. The various topics of these seminars change over a couple of weeks or so. So for the month of October, we talked about generosity, specifically addressing the question, how do people become generous people? One of the resources that we used was a presentation from a study at the University of Notre Dame from its current project called The Science of Generosity. This study establishes that there is an equation composed of seven factors that can measure how likely a person is willing to be generous. Out of these seven factors though, there are three that are the core of the equation. And these core factors must always be positive so that a person could engage in generosity. These are learning to be generous from their family of origin or from uh, their parents, belonging to a church community or a faith community, and having a positive personal identity. The study claims that if you take away one of these three core factors, then the person will likely give less. But if you take away all three core factors, then most likely the person will not give anything at all. And as I reflected on the importance of these factors, of this core, in order to be generous, the story of my grandfather kept coming back to my mind. My grandfather, a now Presbyterian, a retired Presbyterian pastor, comes from a humble background despite the fact that his father owned a significant amount of land in South Mexico City. They were well-known farmers in the area. They had quality crops and quality meat. My grandfather's role growing up was that was the one of a shepherd boy. He spent long days in the fields caring for sheep and talking with nature rather than people. <laughs> His siblings, on the other hand, helped in the farm doing more glamorous work. But as my grandfather and his siblings decided to leave home to study college and become something else, his father decided to sell the land and give each daughter and son some part of the inheritance, some money, so that they could pursue their future endeavors. But my grandfather had decided to go to seminary in order to become a pastor, 
roots of his parents at that time. So you can imagine that kind of him betraying his own family. And that carried some tremendous consequences. No access to land, no resources, no help, and the hardest one being that he was no longer welcome to home. Clearly a quite awful situation. Losing everything, including the people whom you loved, must be one of the most traumatic and painful experiences in life. Yet, despite the adversity of the situation, the grandfather did not ask, where is my portion, dad? Or where is my portion, mom? Or where is my portion, God? He raised his journey forward and reminded himself that the Lord always provides. And that became the very statement that transformed into his inheritance, his portion. He moved forward to become a Presbyterian pastor and serve the church for more than 50 years, including roles at the national level. The Lord had indeed provided. God had looked upon my grandfather with favor and blessed him in so many beautiful ways. But it was only through God's providence shown by the faithful witness of the church that my grandfather encountered a transforming power of generosity. The church gave him shelter when he was without a home. The, the church fed him and clothed him during his time at seminary. The church provided him with everything he and his family ever needed. The church was the beacon of light when everything was darkness. A grandfather did not have the opportunity to learn from his family what it takes to be generous, but because of his trust in the Lord's providence, he said the church filled in that void and showed him that we must always be generous because we have a generous God. Trusting God's providence in such a way like my grandfather is something that, if I dare to be honest, is extremely hard for me. And perhaps it is also hard for you. Being able to get up in the morning and say, the Lord always provides, requires more than simply accepting those words. It is more than just a prayer or a hopeful expectation. Saying the Lord always provides requires that we embrace the harshness and sometimes unfairness of life. When there is no food on the table, when there is no, where is a huge bill that we cannot afford to pay, when a loved one is at the hospital, when there is an eviction notice, when everything we own is consumed by fire or wiped away by water, how can we still say the Lord always provides? Are we allowed to ask in those moments firmly to God, where is my portion? Where are your blessings? Where is your providence and protection? Aren't we allowed to do that? And since sometimes such questions do not find answers, quick answers or any answers at all, it may seem easier to choose despair, anger, and ungratefulness. It is easier to demand answers and act irrationally than paying close attention to the tiny glimpses of goodness that we may encounter in our daily lives. When there is chaos and scarcity, those tiny glimpses of goodness seem so irrelevant and we dismiss them. How can we act in generosity and be grateful when perhaps our experience tells us that there is nothing to be grateful for? There is a controversy of gratitude and therefore a concern for generosity. Not choosing either of those because of the idea that we have nothing and therefore there is nothing that we can do about it. But choosing to see the tiny glimpses of goodness in our lives is not easy. And most certainly cannot happen if we continue to ask, where is my portion of God? So what if we try to embrace the fullness of this journey that we call life with all its ups and downs? And rather echo the words of King David on Psalm 16 saying, Lord, you alone have my portion and my cup. Apart from you, I have no good thing. This poetic statement from David may not seem like much considering the fact that he was king over the land of Israel. But the veracity of these words 
favorite song, he acknowledges that everything he has and the person he has now become is not because of who he is, but because God had chosen to partake in God's abundant grace. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we have also been chosen to partake in God's abundant grace. It is through God's grace that we encounter these tiny glimpses of goodness in our daily lives. Through this abundant grace, God reminds us that God is our portion and God is our inheritance above all things. And this reminder was also given to the Levites as they enter the Promised Land. If you recall, God tells Aaron to communicate to the Levites, I am your share and your possession among the Israelites. While the Levites did not have a physical share of God's blessings, they still received abundant grace by being called to devote their lives to the service of God. The Levites were people in charge of the temple and all the duties related to the worship of God. Therefore, the center of their gratitude and the seat of their generosity was their calling to serve God and God's people. They didn't ask, where is my portion, O God? But rather express through their words and actions that God's abundant grace and God's ever-present providence was more than enough as their inheritance and as their portion. As people chosen to partake in God's abundant grace and God's ever-present providence, we are also invited to give thanks and share it with others. Perhaps we didn't encounter gratitude or generosity through our families or friends or our communities. But I am quite sure that most of us, if not all of us, at some point have actually experienced some form of generosity through the church. And maybe through this church. And if the church is the one positive factor out of the core of the equation, even if everything else is rather negative, or absurd, then that should be more than enough for us to act with generosity. That should be more than enough for us to give thanks to God and give thanks to one another. But generosity goes beyond financial giving. It also includes time and relationships. Christian Smith and Hilary Davidson express in their book, The Paradox of Generosity, that people who find themselves generally grateful engage in various forms of generosity, even if money is tight. A person may still choose to act generously by volunteering his or her time, by being fully present with other people and providing time for those who need it the most, or by showing radical hospitality to people seeking shelter, food, love, and kindness. So generosity is this broad spectrum of things that we are called to do as partakers of God's abundant grace. And since God's abundant grace and providence is our inheritance and our portion, and it is because of this grace and providence that we are called to fully trust God. Every single day. And in trusting God, we are also called to say, the Lord always provides, even when everything else says otherwise. So it is because of this great providence 